Welcome to episode 63 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to retired agent Angelo Lano, who served in the FBI for 29 years. He is interviewed about being the case agent for the FBI's Watergate investigation. Starting from the very morning of June 17, 1972, when he received a phone call from his bureau supervisor instructing him to report to the Watergate complex to investigate a break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Lano's initial assignment was to identify the five men caught in the act and arrested by local police. However, subsequent investigation by Lano and members of his squad quickly determined that this was more than just another interstate theft of stolen property case. They learned that the intruders were connected to the committee to re-elect President Richard Nixon, and the property crime case morphed into the biggest political scandal in the United States history. Lano's investigation produced evidence of a cover-up and led to articles of impeachment being drawn up against Nixon, who resigned in 1974. Angelo Lano was one of several FBI agents falsely accused of being deep throat, a source of leaks to reporters for the Washington Post consisting of inside information about the Watergate investigation. I am absolutely thrilled to bring this interview with Angelo Lano to you. Over the last several months, I know you've heard, like I've heard, references to Watergate and Nixon as it pertains to the FBI's investigation of potential White House connections to the Russians and leaks to the media. Angelo Lano has been through all of this before. And without getting political, we have an opportunity for him to tell us what happened in his case. I want to thank my good friend, Judy Tyler, from episode four, for introducing me to Angelo Lano and making this opportunity to discuss a historically significant investigation possible. Thanks, Judy. Before we get to that interview, I just want to say thank you. You don't know how happy I am, how blessed I am to be doing FBI Retired Case File Review and having it received so favorably, so well by you. And I get so many wonderful emails and messages from listeners, and it just makes me feel proud and happy. This has been a wonderful year and... It's going to be even better because my daughter is getting married on June 10th. And in addition to doing this podcast and trying to finish the first draft of my second book, I am working with her to plan her big fat Jersey wedding. You know, it's a good time to be me. And in addition to my three lovely children and my wonderful husband of 30 years, I also have you to thank for that. I especially want to thank those of you who have signed up for my monthly FBI and books, TV and movie newsletter since I put out the new FBI reading resource, which lists all of the great FBI books written by the FBI agents who've appeared on this podcast my newsletter list has grown substantially. So thank you for that. And if you haven't joined yet, please do by going to jerrywilliams.com and signing up. I have no new reviews for pay to play to report this week. Hey, people, what's up with that? But I do want to thank those of you who have picked up a copy of my crime novel about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. It's still doing great with 58 fabulous reviews and a 4.9 out of five star rating on Amazon. 
When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're helping me to continue to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. Plus, as you can tell from the great reviews, Pay to Play is a good read. So keep the reviews, tweets, posts, and emails coming. Now here's the show. I want to introduce my guest, Angela Lano. Hi, Angie. How are you? Fine, and you? I'm doing great today. This is going to be such a timely episode because everybody is watching, you know, what's happening in the news. Every time I turn around, somebody's saying this is just like Watergate or the leaks are happening just like Watergate. And most people, you know, who are in their, say, 20s and 30s and 40s are thinking like, what's Watergate? You were the case agent of that investigation. Yes. So I'm coming right to you to do a case review of the Watergate investigation. So okay. we'll start with when you first learned about the case, and then maybe then we'll backtrack a little bit, and you can tell us about what was happening in the country at the time. But when did you first get notified that something was up? 8 a.m., uh on the morning of June 17th, 1972, the weekend supervisor, Ernie Belter, called me and, in, and informed me that he had, he had learned from the Metropolitan Police Department that five individuals had been arrested in the process of burglarizing the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the uh, Watergate office complex in uh, Washington, D.C., Okay, so it's a Saturday, and you're not expecting to go to work that day, I, I take it. No, I was expecting to uh, take the boys to uh, baseball practice at about 8.30 that morning. Following uh, Mr. Belder's call, the special agent in charge of the office called me and um, requested that I grab another agent and uh, proceed to the 2nd District Police Headquarters, ascertain exactly uh, what had happened, uh, gather as much information as possible, and then report back to him uh, with, the, with that information. He would uh, then, in turn, uh, advise FBI headquarters uh, about the arrest situation and whether or not the FBI was going to partake in any of the investigation. Why was the FBI called at all, and, and what, what kinds well, of violations were you working? What, what squad were you assigned to at the time? I was assigned to the uh, C2 squad, criminal squad number two, and we handled um, cases that involved theft of government property and interstate transportation of stolen property. Uh, because the district is so small and surrounded by Maryland on one side and Virginia on the other, any time that there was a theft or burglary in excess of $5,000, uh, FBI headquarters had this uh, kind of rule that WFO, Washington Field Office agent or agents, would respond and gather the information and attempt to determine whether or not a federal violation had taken place. So they initially um, reported to the FBI, the Washington, the Washington Police Department, had reported that these were international jewel thieves. So when the word came to me, I'm thinking, jewel thieves, okay, we'll go down and uh, see what we can learn, where they're from, and exactly what were they doing. Um, I did pick up an assistant, uh, another agent named Peter Paul, uh, and we proceeded to the second district headquarters uh, where we met with um, an assistant U.S. attorney, Charles Work, the deputy police commissioner, and um, four members of the uh, Metropolitan Police Department burglary unit, and I worked closely with the burglary unit because we investigated home burglaries where jewel thefts, uh, jewels were stolen or items valued over $5,000 were stolen, so we kind of worked hand-in-hand hand together. And um, uh, during that process, I asked the permission of the uh, deputy chief and the assistant U.S. attorney if we could go ahead and uh, it interviewed the you know, five individuals, which we attempted to, but uh, they all refused to furnish any identification or 
sit down and, and talk to us. So, Why did they think they were international jewel thieves? Were they I, were they from another country? Other than the fact that other than the fact that four of them had provided names of uh, hi- Hispanic origin, uh, Martinez, Gonzalez. Right now, the other two names escape me. Oh, Fiorini. Um, McCord had given the name of uh, Carter at the time of his arrest. So we took it from there that uh, we would take the fingerprint cards um, immediately over to the FBI Identification Division and uh, see if we could ascertain their their real identity, if, in fact, what they had given the police were fictitious names. In the meantime, I asked, uh, and with the permission of the police department and the AUSA, if I could look at the evidence that they had gathered uh, at the time of the arrest. I was permitted to do that, and it was during that uh, lookover that uh, I unzipped a, an AWOL bag, a little gym bag, and inside there there were like 50 rolls of 35-millimeter uh, film. There were three 35-millimeter cameras, very expensive cameras. And um, down at the very bottom, uh, there were some uh, hard items wrapped up in uh, tissue paper. So I unwrapped the paper and these little black things fell out and I had seen items like this before and in my mind uh, I was convinced that it was a device used for intercepting telephone conversations and uh, we set the I set that aside found two others and then asked to see the um, alleged fire alarm bomb because the police also thought that one of the things they recovered the the smoke alarm looked to them to be with all the electronics in it they thought it was possible detonator for some type of bomb as it turned out it was a uh, battery operated microphone which could intercept communications in a living room dining room kitchen wherever it was placed so i asked their permission to send the items over to um, Ernie Belter, who, as a matter of fact, was our electronics expert on on these devices. And uh, Ernie uh, looked at them and called me back uh, and and confirmed that that's what they were. So we knew immediately that we had a possible interception of communication case because these devices were not manufactured. There was no manufacturer in the District of Columbia. So they had to have purchased these electronic uh, wiretap devices outside the District of Columbia and brought them into the district to be used in whatever criminal matter they were involved with. Would it be illegal to have possession of those? In the district it was um, at the time because, number one, they weren't authorized to have them, and number two, um, it was a violation of of the D.C. Code and the Federal Code to uh, possess such devices. After we determined that uh, these were devices that would uh, intercept communications, either telephone or oral conversations, the detectives and the AUSA work continued on the search warrants, and we, we added to the search warrants that they were in possession of these devices. So once the affidavits were completed, uh, the Police went to the local local magistrate and obtained uh, search warrants. The search warrants were for two hotel rooms because at the time of the arrest of the five individuals, uh, two of the five possessed uh, keys to hotel rooms at the Watergate complex, two different rooms. So we then proceeded across, wasn't that far from second second headquarters, second district headquarters. So we proceeded over to the hotel. We divided up there. I think there were like six or seven of us. So one group took one room, and I was with um, Pete, and uh, another agent came along, Don Stuckey, uh, and uh, Detective Art Smith, and another detective. I don't remember his name, but we took one room, and the rest of the guys took, took the second room. In the room that I went to, when we entered the hotel room, it, this was on like the second floor the bed was just littered with wallets, bills, dollar bills, identifications, and 
I believe it was one antenna, if I remember correctly. Now, the identifications came back uh, with, as it turns out, the true identities of the people that were arrested because when Pete returned from the IDENT division, we found out that four of the individuals that were arrested had one time or another been fingerprinted by the CIA, and one showed employment with CIA and as well as having been employed by the FBI, and that was James McCord. So we were kind of betwixt and between what we were doing. You weren't sure what was going on. No, we didn't know who these people were from Adam. But when the identification division sent sent uh, Pete back with all the um, uh, details of their backgrounds, their their rap sheets, um, we we looked at it and then we matched that up with the identifications that we found on the beds uh, on the bed in the uh, in the hotel room. Um, they were, when they were arrested, some, I think it was just the Cubans, had about $3,000 in $100 bills between the four of them, and a couple of the $100 bills were sequential. On the bed in the hotel room, I think there was another $3,500, and probably half of that was in sequential numbers. Um... So we copied down. I copied down those serial numbers. The police did the the inventory. It was their search warrant. So they gathered whatever evidence we found on the on the uh, bed, and then in one dresser drawer, uh, Don Stuckey, the uh, the other agent that came to assist us, he found a an envelope which contained a check issued by Howard Hunt, payable to a country club in Maryland. It was back dues or something like that. It was minimal. It was like six dollars and thirty cents or something like that. Um, but it was, you know, minimal. So what, what was that doing there? But um, so we we gathered up everything from that floor down on the down on the other the other apartment or the other hotel room. Uh, they found more. They just found clothing, a couple of suitcases. Nothing of any any great significance that would. Uh, would cause any any concern. Andrew, uh, let me ask you a question. Business. Sure. Yeah, let me ask you a question because I'm not sure if we said yet the building where they were found, what was in that building, and exactly where they were arrested. They were arrested in the Watergate office complex. The Watergate has, it consists of a hotel known as the Watergate Hotel. It has another complex attached to the hotel, which is the Watergate office complex, and uh, I think it's like eight or nine stories, or was, uh, down on the first floor, there's like a beauty salon, small grocery store, you know, different, like like a strip mall. And then on the, attached to the office building is the Watergate uh, condominium and apartment complex. So it's, it's like a semicircle. It starts with a hotel, bends around, with the office in the middle, and then on the left-hand side was the were the condominiums. In the condominiums, of course, Martha and John Mitchell had a, had their uh, condo. I think it was on the fifth floor. So they were found in the it, office, office complex. Office complex. Yes. After hours, they should not have been there. Two two thirty in the morning. Yes, they were arrested inside the Democratic National Committee headquarters, which was on the sixth or seventh floor of the. Uh, Watergate office complex. Okay, uh, so they were actually caught in the act. Oh, they were caught, yes. They were caught okay. in the act of, of burglarizing the office, yes. All right, so now you're back in the room. You're finding all of these things. After we wrap up there, Pete, I, and, and Stuckey go back to the field office, and um, I pick up the phone, and I start telling the, the two supervisors. Actually, there were two supervisors on duty then, and then uh, picked up the phone and called Kunkel and told him what was going on, what we, what was located, and he said, continue searching as much as you can, try and find out where these people came from, other than McCord, because we knew he was from Maryland, but we we weren't sure as to uh, where the uh, Cubans had come from, although we did find uh, two driver's licenses, which indicated two of them had come from Miami. So we began uh, searching files and uh, 
we found out that the FBI had conducted a, a background investigation on Howard Hunt to be a consultant at the White House. Our White House liaison agent happened to be in the office that day, and we I asked him if he would uh, nose around at the White House, see if he could find out if this guy Hunt uh, still had a pass or was working at the White House. That was George Saunders. So Saunders took that lead. In the meantime, Stuckey and Pete took a bureau car and they went looking for Howard Hunt to, number one, find out why his check was in that hotel room and whether or not he was there. I'll go briefly through that. They did eventually find him somewhere around 6 o'clock that evening at his home. Um, he did admit that he uh, had it, had written a check. Uh, he didn't say where he left it. Uh, when they began to interview him ab- about uh, the break-in and his his uh, check being at the Watergate Hotel, he claimed uh, the Fifth Amendment and would not speak to us again, or further in that matter. I was back at the office talking to the agent on duty down in Miami. Uh, we had subsequently determined that all four individuals, other than McCord, of, of Latin descent, were from the Miami area. So I was giving them instructions on what we wanted. We wanted background. We wanted to know who they are, what they were do, uh, what their livelihood was, any criminal uh, act, any criminal record down there in the in the Miami area. George Saunders came back to the office and said he had spoken with uh, Alexander Butterfield, and we found out that according to Butterfield, who was an aide to the uh, to the president at, over at the White House, uh, according to Butterfield, Hunt had been a consultant. He was formally employed by Charles Colson, an aide to the president, and that his consulting term, according to Butterfield, had ended in March. Uh, however, they determined that Hunt never turned in his White House pass, so he's still running around with a White House pass. Butterfield did not know exactly what type of consulting activity uh, Hunt had performed for uh, Charles Colson. We asked if Colson was on duty that day or at the White House, and they said no, so we uh, tried to set up an appointment the following day or so. We worked the phones most of that afternoon into the evening, and I spoke to um, Henry Peterson, who was the Deputy Attorney General Criminal Division. Uh, He called over to the field office because uh, word had gotten out that a burglary had occurred at Democratic Committee headquarters and that the FBI was looking into it, and Henry found out about it, and he called over, and I basically filled him in as to what we had learned and where we were going. He said that he would have, he would uh, contact the uh, Attorney General of the United States, Richard Kleindings at that time, and inform him, and Henry wanted to be kept uh, uh, up to date on everything that happened from from 9 o'clock that night till Monday morning, which which we did. Um, so Kunkel's word that I would be home in two hours actually didn't work out. I think I got, <laughs> I think I got home about quarter to one Sunday morning. So <laughs> it was a long day, a long day and a long night. Angie, this might be the right time for you to kind of backtrack and tell us what's happening in the political atmosphere uh, in the country at that time. We've mentioned the president. And I don't know if we've actually said who's the president and what's happening in the country uh, okay. during this time period. Well, in 1968, Richard Nixon was uh, elected uh, president of the United States. And during his campaign, he talked about crime in America and that um, things were going to change for the better, that uh, he was going to bring in a strong attorney general and he had named John Mitchell, I believe, at that time. So after the swearing-in, um, Nixon's cabinet takes their place in government, and Henry Kissinger is sworn in as the National Security Advisor. With the National Security Council, sometime in 
mid-1969, uh, different confidential and classified material from the National Security Council begins appearing uh, either in the local media, television, or newspaper, um, and and this disturbs uh, Henry Kissinger and the president. They went and, I believe, they had a meeting, if I recall correctly, they had a meeting with the Attorney General and uh, J. Edgar Hoover at the time. And because of all the um, leakage of this classified material, which dealt with the operations of the uh, National Security Council and, and the internal workingships of the uh, uh, Nixon administration, Kissinger and his aide had come up with a list, I believe, of 17 possible suspects, some being newsmen, some being uh, on the National Security Council itself. They obtained permission from the Attorney General who authorized National Security wiretaps, uh, which the FBI conducted at the time. And shortly, not too long after that, um, while that investigation was going on, um, I think we proceed about a year or so later. We have all the activity about the Vietnam War. Things really boil up when uh, Nixon uh, orders the mining of uh, uh, Haiphong Harbor over in, in Vietnam. Protests just start mounting all over the country, but more so in uh, in, in Washington. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people would come to Washington at any given time and and, uh, and demonstrate in the streets. So we had that activity going on. And then uh, at the height of that, Daniel Ellsberg, who was working, I believe, at, at one point for the RAND Corporation, had access to what is commonly known as the Pentagon Papers, classified material that dealt mainly with uh, U.S. activity in, in, uh, in Vietnam. And... Ellsberg eventually causes that information to be leaked to uh, newspapers. Uh, I believe it was the Washington Post, New York Times, and uh, L.A. Times. An investigation was undertaken concerning Ellsberg, and because it involved uh, the, the Pentagon Papers, uh, the classified information from the government, the uh, White House, being upset as it was with previous leaks, with the National Security Council, came up with this idea that, uh, well, the FBI can investigate this, but we can investigate uh, other things too. And they came up with the, quote, plumber's unit. And the plumber's unit was just a group of two to four individuals who undertook investigations on their own and reported back to uh, aides of the president. I believe it was uh, Eagle Crow and uh, John Ehrlichman. So, can I ask a question? Did sure. the did the attorney general at the time know about these plumbers group? Did the did J. Edgar Hoover at the time was he aware that they were conducting their own investigation? There, uh, in in a roundabout way, there was there was uh, again leakage of information that there was a supposed unit at the White House that was was conducting investigation and. They were actually asking for for uh, reports from the bureau, but uh, I think uh, Mr. Hoover was smart enough not to uh, release any information to that quote unit. Um, did the attorney general know? Uh, I, I'm going to have to say yes because uh, he was reporting. He was getting information about the the 17 wiretaps, and he he knew the people that were uh, involved in leak investigations. At the uh, at the White House, as it turns out, the people involved in the investigative part of the plumbers unit uh, was uh, G. Gordon Liddy, uh, who eventually brought in as a partner E. Howard Hunt. Those two did their thing in investigations while they were looking into the Ellsberg matter, because the bureau, I believe, did not meet the satisfactory standards that the White House was looking for. So with the consent and consultation with uh, John Ehrlichman and Eagle Crow, Hunt and Liddy undertook 
with the with a couple of the Cubans from Miami an idea to break in and burglarize the office of Dr. Fielding out in Los Angeles. Dr. Fielding was a psychiatrist who was treating or had treated Daniel Ellsberg and the plumbers unit figured, well, we can gain more insight into Ellsberg and um so so they had planned this burglary. They went out there, they broke into his off broke into Fielding's office took some photographs, but never found a file on, on uh, Daniel Ellsberg. But they committed a burglary. Okay. And they violated, as it turns out, they violated his civil rights. But at the time, law enforcement is not no. aware of this. No, first. no. They, no, they no. got away clean. They got away clean. And I take that back. I mean, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm researching my mind here. I believe there was a report of a break-in, but it it never came back to... Uh, as a solved matter because uh, the individuals were never caught or identified. And if I remember correctly, um, the Cubans who actually did the break-in um, were were wearing uh, rubber gloves. This burglary at the National Democratic Committee offices at the Watergate, why were they there? No, they were uh, – the, the break-in, as best as we could put it at the time, was to determine how the Democratic – committee or democratic party uh was being uh, who was funding the uh, democratic national committee where were the monies coming from word had come from somewhere uh that money was coming from outside the united states so the idea was for the guys to go in there and uh take photographs rifle the files try and find lists or in inventory notices of amounts of monies received and where the monies were coming from, uh, who were their big contributors, uh, things of that nature. That actually took place in May of 72 before before the individuals were arrested on, on June 17th. That was their second entry. Their first entry in May enabled them to um, uh, place the bugs in the, in the phones and, um, and, and rifle the files. And we know they rifled the files because when we were, the agents in, in Miami were conducting an, their investigation into the background of the four Cubans, uh, they found um, an individual uh, who ran a photography store and uh, who came to the FBI and reported that uh, he knew some of these individuals who had been arrested and that they had brought to him uh, a month earlier film and he recalled developing the film and seeing uh, documents, something about Democratic Committee and uh, the, the design of the rug in the background uh, of the photographs. Apparently, they laid the uh, documents on the floor and took pictures of them. And the the, uh, the labels, the, the uh, designation Democratic National Committee headquarters was identical to the stationary at at uh, the Watergate office complex, and the photograph showed background of a rug. The rug in the photograph matched the rug that was on the floor in the Democratic National Committee office. So that's how you knew that they had already burglarized the, the offices before. Yes. So this really is a, a separate investigation. We had the plumber's unit looking for leaks, and I guess once they started doing that type of investigation on their own, then they decided it was okay to now start looking into the Democratic Party. Right, but uh, but but the investigation that I was involved in had nothing to do with with uh, Ellsberg or um, a anything to do with Pentagon Papers, anything like that. That that was that was separate and apart from from our investigation. Okay. All right. So you set out leads to Miami. You are starting to get more information about who these individuals, five individuals, are. And I take it it's becoming a little bit clearer as to what they were trying to do. So on on Monday Monday morning, the let's see, seventeen, eighteen, morning of the nineteenth, we receive a phone call from the former night manager of the Howard Johnson's hotel. Now, we knew nothing about the Howard Johnson's Hotel, 
but we receive a phone call from the Howard Johnson's hotel night manager who had seen McCord's photograph in the newspaper on Sunday uh, of McCord. They, I think it was him getting into the back of a paddy wagon. Uh, he reports to the FBI that uh, he remembered McCord requesting a room at the Howard Johnson's, paying in $100 bills. He took a room, I think it was on the fourth floor. He took it for three or four days, came back to the to the manager a few days later and said, I need a different room. I want to go up higher. So he gave him another couple hundred dollars, paid for like a week in advance, went up higher. And um, the night manager recalled that, yes, McCord was in and out of the hotel frequently, but he said there was another individual who stayed in the room most of the time and didn't come out. So we we uh, had gotten a subpoena, and we got the records from the from the uh, Howard Johnsons, and uh, we started looking at the phone records and found out that there were numerous calls being made to a place, a home, or an office in Connecticut. One of the I think it was a home. It turns out that it was the mother of an individual named Alfred Baldwin. Baldwin, we we do a background on him uh, with the FBI and. We ascertained that Baldwin, again, a former agent, and his mother, I think she said, I think if I recall the interview correctly, she was interviewed by agents up in Connecticut, and she said that her son was working for the uh, committee to reelect the president. He was a security guard or something to that uh, effect. We went searching for Mr. Baldwin, found him, and he immediately uh, requested not to be interviewed, and wanted to speak to an attorney first. We find out in the interview of Baldwin with his lawyer that he was the person in the hotel room who was monitoring conversations, the intercepts coming from the Democratic National Committee headquarters. He went through the whole routine. He told us about the break-in in May. He told us about the break-in the night of June 17th, and he told us about... Uh, the two individuals who were, quote, standing guard over in the Watergate Hotel, one being Howard Hunt, and the other one, he knew him to be, in name only, George. We had a photograph of uh, of George, and uh, it turned out that George was G. Gordon Liddy. So Liddy enters, enters the picture, another former bureau agent working for the committee to reelect the president. So let me back up a little bit here. In that hotel room during the during the search, there were two telephone address books. Uh, one was a flip top, one of those metal type that you just dial the the pointer to, uh, like the letter A, and up and it pops, pops up. It. Yeah, pops I remember up. those. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you, you gotta be you gotta that be takes, a little older to remember yeah, right. that. That takes us back. Yeah. But on the other the other one, as it turns out, is a telephone personal telephone. Uh, directory of, that belonged to uh, Bernard Barker. Now, Barker was one of the, the Cubans uh, who was uh, arrested that night on June 17th. And Barker's address book was a telephone number, and all it said was E.H., that would be Edward H. Howard, and W.H. being White House, and a telephone number. So uh, we find that number, and we said we got to find out you know who this phone belongs to and it turns out that it's the telephone company says this is really tricky this phone is subscribed to by a young lady named Kathleen Chanel she lives in Alexandria Virginia however the telephone is located in the executive office building of the white house wow uh okay well it turns out that eh stood for Edward Howard Hunt. Hunt was known to the Cubans as Eduardo, and everybody called him Eduardo. He was their 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 main person. So we uh, go looking for Kathleen Chanel, and actually she ends up being on vacation, and she's over in in London. Also in that book was a telephone number, and it just said GG, which we later figure out to be Gordon G. Gordon Liddy telephone number turned out to be a a number located in the committee to reelect the president. And when the agents uh, called that number, the secretary for Gordon Liddy answered the phone 
and the agents went over and, and uh, attempted to interview Liddy, but he took the fifth immediately, and uh, that was our other entry into the committee to reelect the president. From there, wow, we began an extensive investigation on McCord. At the time of the arrest of the Cubans, they had two walkie-talkies in their possession. We were able to trace them back to Philadelphia. They were purchased uh, in Philadelphia, Motorola, I believe they were, or Bell & Howe, one or the other. Anyway, uh, the people up in Philadelphia identified McCord as the person purchasing the walkie-talkies. Al Baldwin, when the arrest went down, told us that Howard Hunt came into the hotel room and had put some electronic material, it turns out to be a walkie-talkie and a couple of two walkie-talkies and a couple of antennas in the suitcase uh, that was in the room where Baldwin was staying. When we eventually found those, they also tracked back to uh, McCord's purchase in Philadelphia earlier that year. The $100 bills, the burglary squad, Washington Police Department, and my squad, C2, in addition to handling theft of government property and fraudulent interstate transportation of stolen property cases, we also handled bombing matters. And between 1969 and I want to say early 72, there were some sporadic bombings along Embassy Row, as we called it, maybe during that period of time, maybe six over the, over the two-year span. Nothing of any real damage. I mean, something being thrown over a fence or something like that. But anyway, I uh, we worked closely with uh, a member of the... Uh, uh, with the United States Secret Service on those matters, and uh, I developed a uh, uh, close working relationship with with an agent there. So the afternoon of the of our initial investigation, when I saw the sequential numbers, I immediately thought of him being with the Treasury Department. Hey, John can help us out. So I put in a call to him, and un unfortunately, he couldn't do anything until Monday. But uh, the Secret Service really helped us because they tracked. The hundred dollar bills from the day they were printed, we found them. We, they they were shipped from, let's see, Washington to Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta shipped money to the Republic National Bank in Miami, and I think it was that the sum of money might have been fifty thousand dollars in hundred dollar bills. When you found them, they were sequentially numbered yeah, they, and they, they were new been, bills. Yeah, they were. They were brand new. They were seven. Seven or eight, I believe, maybe maybe a little bit more, not not many, but they were sequential. Um, so we we the the Secret Service really helped us out. They traced them right to the bank, uh, and we had agents go to uh, the Federal Reserve in Atlanta, then to the Miami Reserve, and right to the Republic National Bank. And um, so we started looking with subpoenas. We started looking at the bank accounts of the Cubans down there in Florida. And lo and behold, we find in Barker's account, we find that he had deposited two checks. No, actually, wait a minute, five checks into his bank account that were not made out to him. They were made out to the committee to reelect the president. And wow. You're talking was, about a smoking gun. <laughs> <laughs> one was one like was a big for, arrow, you know, oh a big my arrow God. pointing. Uh -huh. Yeah, like, well, what's this about? So one was for $25,000. And it was from, uh, it was a, a um, what do you call that, cashier's check. And it was signed by uh, uh, Kenneth Dahlberg. And then there were four other checks from a bank in Mexico City bearing the name of Daniel Ogario. Uh, so we're, <laughs> we're wondering, like, what, what, are, what are you telling me here? So we find out that, that uh, the manager is really cooperative, and he tells us, that uh, uh, Barker had brought those checks in there, and he was accompanied by another individual, who we later find out to be uh, uh, Liddy and Hunt. The checks were deposited, and then they were the monies were withdrawn a week or two later. It happened to coincide with the delivery of the brand new one hundred dollar bills. So those brand new one hundred dollar bills were given, along with the hundred and fourteen thousand dollars, to Barker, who turned the money over to Liddy, who brought the money back to the committee to reelect the president. Now, question is, 
How did the money cut out of the committee to reelect the president into the Watergate office complex burglary? <laughs> yes. Yes. It, well, it works. Is, is, there, is there a connection? <laughs> oh, yes. The connection. the connection is G. Gordon Liddy, who happens to be the um, – he's working actually in the finance department of the committee to reelect the president. And in his, quote, escapade in, in, uh, in investigating the Democratic National Committee, he's he's allotted – I think Magruder said $250,000 to do his investigations and whatever else he was going to do. So when he needed money, he'd go to the finance officer, and the finance officer would deal him out these $100 bills. Well, lo and behold, there's our $100 bills, fresh out of Miami, right into the committee to reelect the president, right into Liddy's hands, right into the Watergate Hotel. <laughs> Couldn't be clear. It's like oh, a... Oh, my God. It's, uh, yeah, it's like a, a map leading you oh, right there. You, you couldn't believe, you couldn't believe the map if I showed it to you. So how you quickly believe. did all of this come together? You know, you've got agents all over the country, you've got or, you to know, be East Coast. Me. Oh. Yeah, so yeah. how quickly were you able to put all of these pieces together? Well, we had to have it done by September because, uh, what do we have, 90 days after arrest to get an indictment? So it all came to fruition for the for the seven individuals in September of of uh, 1972, of course, when we interviewed people like Mitchell, Marie Stans, Hugh Sloan, Jeb Magruder, Herb Porter, Fred Larue, they all lied. They all committed perjury immediately. They lied to the FBI in every interview. Um, but they weren't. But we didn't know that at the time. And did you work criminal cases or? Or you, yeah, you, I've worked. I worked all fraud and economic okay. crime cases. So, so you know the game. Uh, if you think there's somebody above the person that you arrested and convicted, you want to throw them back into the grand jury and give them immunity and get them to testify about anything else. Well, that was our game plan. Pick pick one or two of the seven that we indicted and, and convicted, and put them into the grand jury and see what see if there's anything else left out there. We always felt that there was something there, but we just couldn't put our finger on it. In February of 1973, L. Patrick Gray had been designated by the president. The president recommended Gray to become the new director. So, of course, he had to go before the Judiciary Committee. Because Hoover died. Because Hoover Hoover died in in May, yes, of 72, yes. So, in February 23rd, 1973... Gray called a conference at his office. Mark Felt, Charlie Bates, uh, Bob Gebhardt, Jack McDermott, Kunkel, myself, and Charlie Newsom. Uh, Newsom was a uh, headquarters Division Five supervisor. Gebhardt was the assistant director. Charlie Bates had been the assistant director, but stepped down and, and moved to San Francisco as the SAC. And, of course, Mark Felt was the number two man. Jack McDermott at that time was, was my boss. And Kunkel, of course, he had been transferred out to St. Louis. So Gray had called this meeting. And he, you know, said, well, you all know that I'm, I'm being nominated and I've got to go before the committee. And is there, I'm going to ask you now if I did anything wrong during that investigation. And he had a sign of a document saying that he never... Uh, held up any request or never stopped any request or any part of the investigation. During that conference, he informed us that during our investigation from June of 72 until January of 73, he had been allowing John Dean, the White House counsel, to come to the FBI office and pick up copies of our reports teletypes, and 302s, and review them. And I literally jumped out of my chair at the conference room. I couldn't believe it. And all I said was, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And they wanted to know what I was upset about. And I said, I'll tell you what I'm upset about. You allowed John Dean to read everything that we were doing. So John Dean is the person who prepped all these people before they went before the grand jury, 
and before they went to trial or testified at trial, he he knew exactly where we were going, what we were doing, and what we were going to ask each individual, and he prepped them to answer differently. Yeah, and what was L. Patrick Gray's, why would he give that information out? The way I looked at it, um, I always felt this. Gray was a submarine commander during the war. I always looked at Gray as the captain and Nixon as the admiral. And whatever the admiral spoke, the captain said, yes, sir. Gray had gotten word from the president that Dean was going to oversee the investigation for the White House and requested Gray to cooperate with Dean. I, I'm assuming that Gray took that to be, whatever you learn, tell Dean. And that's where it all went, it went wrong. That's amazing. And what was, uh, and what was L. Patrick Gray's position before he became acting director? Uh, he was an assistant attorney general in the Civil Rights Division, I believe, of the Justice Department. It's like a no-brainer that you would not provide confidential FBI reports and 302s well, to well, the other happened? side oh, yeah. during well, an ongoing investigation. Well, see, there was he he uh, he did ex- Gray did explain, and he 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 sent he he prepared a uh, memorandum, and it came down from our from. It wasn't John Mintz. Uh, for some reason, Mintz didn't partake in that. It was a guy named Dwight Dalby, who was assistant legal counsel for the FBI. And he wrote a, a four- or five-page memorandum explaining how the FBI disseminates information to the White House. And our, my, my chief response to Dalby's memo was, you don't tell the White House anything when you're investigating people working in the White House. But Dalby said it was it was okay. He gave the green light that it was legal to advise the White House on different investigations. But they they over they overstepped their bounds when when this investigation involved active people in the White House. So why would you tell why would you tell the rat where the cheese is, right? I think I left that meeting early because <laughs> Nobody could believe why I became so upset. And then, of course, everybody, it started dawning on everyone. And then I walked down to the to the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office and told Earl Silbert, who was the chief prosecutor for the, for the government at that time. And I, I just said, Earl, you're not going to believe this. I said, but I, I think I know why our case is so screwed up. Gray was giving out all the information every day, every damn teletype. I would write at night. I had to do a summary every night, and I wouldn't get out. I wouldn't leave the office till like nine, ten, sometimes eleven o'clock at night, because I had to wait for all the offices to respond, and then summarize all their investigation, send it over, and then tell the bureau what our next step was, where we were going next. And you know, if I had known that the next morning John Dean would be sitting on the steps of the fifth floor reading teletypes, ah, unbelievable. So anyway, we got through February. Then came March of '73, time to sentence the uh, the seven individuals. And uh, when he got to McCord, uh, Judge Sirica paused and said that he had a letter from McCord that he wanted to read, and he read it in open court. And McCord, who had been found guilty along with uh, with G. Gordon Lee in a trial. McCord says in his letter that there were higher ups involved, and he named John Mitchell and possibly the president. We didn't know about the letter at the time. The U.S. attorney knew about it, but the judge would not release the letter. And we, the U.S. attorney, asked McCord to go before the grand jury immediately, but the judge overruled and sent McCord down to the Senate to meet with the uh, what was that committee? Senate, Senate, Senator Irving had the Watergate committee hearings. They sent, they sent McCord down there to tell his story. So as soon as, as soon as that letter was revealed in court, John Dean and Jeb Magruder immediately found lawyers and were beating down the door of the U.S. Attorney's Office to, uh, to admit to their obstruction of justice and perjury. Oh, because they knew, they knew that the, the truth was coming out. The, the handwriting was on the wall. Yep. 
Yeah, so what happened? Uh... The, well, the, the Cubans were sentenced. The Hunt was sentenced along with the Cubans. They were all sentenced. And then uh, Liddy was sentenced. But McCord was given a uh, – he, he was – he was going. He was sentenced, but his sentence, sentence was delayed until he uh, complied with the judge's order about meeting with the Senate, and then uh, uh, eventually he does come before the uh, before the grand jury. So they all go off to jail, and and we begin phase two of the Watergate investigation. Okay. Um, phase but, two. The purpose of phase two. Your goal in phase two is to. Going- we're going for the higher ups now. Now we're going for Colson, Ehrlichman, Haldeman, Mitchell, and Mitchell. Yeah, yes, Mitchell, Marty, and Fred Larue, Maurice Stance, Hugh Sloan. Um, and at this time, you're looking at them because you believe that they um, approved and knew about the break-in at the. Yeah. You do not know about anything else that they may have authorized. Well, we subsequently learn, we, we subsequently learned during that second part that the burglary of, of Fred Fielding's office in, in Los Angeles, uh, the Ellsberg matter came to fruition and, uh, that, that, um, that caused another stir. No, we, we actually, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. There was a point early on in the case where where we uh, were interviewing White House personnel, and uh, we let this one guy go before the grand jury. We didn't we didn't interview him. We were we had so many people to talk to, so we sent some to the grand jury and some we interviewed. And uh, this one guy mentioned that uh, we were interested if if there were any memorandums about this type of leak activity, any memorandum that would have gone anywhere, would the president have known? Would he have seen anything? And this one guy made a comment that every night before he goes to bed, the president dictates uh, his daily activity. And at some point, um, Earl Earl had confronted me about this a year a year after the the, uh, the case. He said, "Didn't I mean an Earl?" Didn't I subpoena the president's uh, dictaphone, dictating machine, dictating notes, memorandum? And I said, yeah, because I served it. And he says, we never got anything. Well, the hearings are going on at uh, the Senate. And Alex Butterfield, the guy that we had spoken to on the first day of the investigation, sits on national TV and tells the the United States Senate and the people of the United States that Nixon had a recording device set up in the White House and the executive office building. <laughs> and of course, you know, we said, oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> and so did you reissue that subpoena? Or, or, or No, because what happened was just about that time, I think it was April or May of 73, uh, Elliot Richardson, who was the attorney general, ordered that a special prosecutor be appointed to take over the case. So Earl and Seymour and Don were pulled off, and in came Archibald Cox, and the special prosecutor's assistants were brought in. I think there was like 30 of them. So they took over the investigation. They took over phase two. Actually, Earl started phase two. We had it rolling, and then... And then a Watergate special prosecutor's office came in. And so that was the end of the, the 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 case for you. No, no, I stayed. No, no, I stayed with it all the way to the end. No, no, oh, no. Oh, okay. They kept. Okay. They left. They wouldn't let me go. <laughs> I wanted out, but they wouldn't let me go. We did a lot of things. I mean, it's, I could just go on for hours. But um, uh, at some point, there's the fight over the White House tapes. Nixon tells Cox basically back off. I'm not giving you any tapes. Uh, Cox takes Nixon to court. Nixon loses. Co- uh, Nixon orders Cox to be fired. The night before that happened, I saw McDermott, who was my SAC at the time, and it was a Friday evening, and he was going into the building. I was leaving to go home. One of the days I got to go home at 6 o'clock, and he was coming into the building, and I was leaving, and I said, I'm 
I'm taking the kids and my wife, and we're going away for the weekend. Don't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. We got up the next morning, and we drove from Washington to uh, Luray Cabins in Virginia. And we had a nice day. Family outing, finally. And um, we came home, pulled in the driveway. The kids were asleep in the in the station wagon. And the windows were kind of open in the house, and the phone's ringing. And my wife jumps out of the car, and I said, don't go in the house. Don't answer that phone. We didn't have the radio on. We didn't know anything. So she runs in the house, answers the phone, comes back and says, it's Jack McDermott. He wants you right away. So McDermott says, where have you been? I said, we went to Luray Cabins. I told you I was taking a day off. Do you know what's going on? I said, no, and I don't care. He says, you better care. He said, Cox has been fired. You've got to get down here and take over the Watergate office. I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, we're, we're, we're working on indicting the president, and you want me to go down? No way. I'm not going down there. Get down there. Do your job. Don't let them take anything out. I figured, holy crap. So I pick up my best buddy again, Pete Paul, my savior. And Pete and I go down there, and it, the office was on K Street. And there's reporters all over the place. So we get our way in, get upstairs, and the assistant prosecutors, uh, Cox wasn't there, but Henry Ruth, uh, his assistant was there. Henry was a number two man. And uh, they look at me and they said, "You." they start calling me names, you traitor. And I said, I'm not a traitor. I'm, don't, I'm, you know, we're not doing anything. Do your job. Get your work done. You know, And go home. I'll stay here. I'll watch the store for you. You know, why were they calling you a traitor? I'm I'm confused. Because because the FBI had been ordered in to seal the offices of the Watergate special prosecutor. And there I was, having worked with these guys for God, almost a year. And uh, they you know, we they treated me like I was one of their own. And then here I am coming in there and telling them you know, you can't take anything out. But, you know, after a couple of hours of of carrying on, yelling and screaming at one another. We finally got it down to civility. I, I stayed. There was one guy who tried to leave the office. He had something in his briefcase, and I just said, Ben, open the briefcase. No, you're not going to search my briefcase. Ben, I don't want you taking anything out of here. Just open a briefcase. I don't care. What... And he had a banana and a book in there or something. <laughs> but, of course, that made the headlines, you know. You know, it so basically, the the, the uh, president fires Cox, and the president is using the FBI now to secure the yeah, secure the investigation, secure the uh, the documents and everything. And I, you know, I yeah, didn't touch awkward. Anything. Yeah, very awkward. Yeah, and I, and I didn't touch. We didn't touch anything. As a matter of fact, they did exactly what I asked them to do. Hey, do me a favor. If you're leaving, lock the damn file cabinets. Lock everything. Take the keys with you, as far as I'm concerned. Don't leave anything here. Take the pens, the papers, anything you want. Get it out of here. Just don't take any documents with you, that's all. And the ones that stayed behind did their work. The others went home, you know, grumpy, growling, and still swearing at me. But, you know, (laughs) what are you going to do? But then the following Monday, when dust settled, they called the office and said, when are you coming to work? (laughs) (laughs) I'll be there in a few minutes. Uh. So what they were basically afraid of was that the investigation was going to be shut down or that right. somebody would compromise yeah. or, or take their, their uh, the evidence yeah. and documents that they had pulled together. Yeah. Well, we win. they win the fight, and uh, they win the fight to get the tapes, and uh, the tapes finally start coming out. And uh, Cox, of course, was fired, so Leon Jaworski comes in. And when the tapes are going to be released, Jaworski talks to Clarence Kelly, who was then director of the FBI. And Kelly, uh, he asked Kelly, he says, I want the FBI to transcribe these tapes. Uh, so um, with the help of the Bureau, we reach out to uh, several field offices, and we they send me nine uh, young ladies who are familiar with the Title III uh, transcripts. So... These young ladies come to town. I set them up in the Howard Johnson's hotel. 
where they could look across the street at the Democratic National Committee headquarters office. <laughs> um, and uh, I set them, we set up on the fourth floor with uh, recording machines, typewriters, everything. And these, these young ladies work, uh, wow, almost through the summer transcribing uh, the White House tapes. They were thrilled. Uh, and, and they had a good time. Um, they worked they worked a day shift. And then they said, you know, we'd like to see Washington, so why don't we work 4 to 12? Okay, work 4 to 12. Do what you want. We'll just get the tapes. And and uh, and they, they did a fantastic job. I, I can't remember how many we did. Um, I know it was closer to 75, maybe. Something like that. But anyway, it was really, it was really, really good for them. And then on the last day, when they transcribed the last tape, I marched them all up to uh, to K Street to the Watergate Special Prosecutor's Office. And while we were, while they were walking from one hallway to another, um, they got to see in a inter- in an interview room, uh, Pat Gray was being interviewed. In another office, John Dean was being interviewed, and. We uh, walked into the uh, office of Leon Jaworski, the Watergate special prosecutor, and presented him with the last tape. And, of course, he had a nice conversation with the with the young ladies. Two were from Detroit, and they were leaving that day. So we managed to get them all into two or three different vehicles, and we drove over to Washington National Airport, where guess what happened over there? They We run into Frank Wills who is the security guard who found the tape of uh, the night of the burglary. He's on his way to Chicago. And the assistant United States attorney, Chuck Work, who was going to, I think he was en route to Atlanta on, on another matter. So th- th- these, young, these young women, I mean, they had it all. They got to listen to the president, John Dean, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Colson, Mitchell, on tape, and then they get to see... You know some of the, some of the people in real life. Ah, what an experience! Oh yeah, it was. It was. A, mm. So, what do you get from the tapes? We get uh, conversations with uh, John Dean and the president, and Haldeman and Mitchell, or Haldeman and Ehrlichman, uh, talking about the Watergate case, uh, talking about what was being developed, who was being questioned, what they were saying. Uh, talking about the money, uh, the money transfers, about the checks that were in Barker's account, everything. The whole case was laid out on the tapes. And then I think it was after the, the girls had left, I think it was like a week or two later, the Office of Counsel for the President announced that they had found another tape. And it turns out to be the smoking gun tape, tape of June, June 23rd, where Haldeman and Nixon are talking about get get CIA to tell Pat Gray to knock it off. No more investigation by the FBI. Tell them that they're trampling on CIA territory and it could cause national security issues. Tell them to back off. And that was a smoking gun. That, that's the tape that caused the president to resign. Oh. The interesting thing about that tape is that in the, in the conversation, Haldeman says to the president... The agents handling the case over there believes that that this is really a CIA matter. Now, this is June the 23rd, 1972. On June the 21st, two days earlier, prior to his going to a meeting at, with Pat Gray, Bob Kunkel was my SAC, and I was reporting to him every day, like at 5 o'clock. So... I was down there on June 21st, and we're having a a short brief meeting about what's going on, what have we learned, and this is four days after the break-in. And I said to to Kunkel, we're not getting any cooperation from the CIA, and I'm really starting to think that this might be something that these guys are involved in, because look at all the backgrounds, everybody except Liddy. Everybody involved is CIA connected. It's got to be a CIA matter, but they're not cooperating with us. Well, Kunkel carries that message over to FBI headquarters. Pat Gray talks to John Dean every day, according to his own telephone logs, two or three times a day he's talking to John Dean. And when that 
when that tape came out a year and a half later, I often wondered if um, Kunkel had died in the meantime. But I often wondered if Kunkel had told Gray what what you had said, what I had said, and it made its way from Kunkel's mouth to Gray's mouth to John Dean's mouth over to Haldeman into the president. <laughs> I'm thinking, holy mackerel, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. What a part of history. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, just the, the, the thought that that could have transpired like that is, is it, absolutely it is. amazing. It is. So it was your fault. <laughs> it was my fault. The whole thing was my fault. Uh, I, 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 I guess, yeah, uh, the, the only, I didn't have any recourse. There were, there were a couple, there was really one thing said about me during the whole case. No, two. Uh, one thing said about me during the whole case, and that was, Ehrlichman, in the presence of Haldeman and Nixon, said that I'm I'm not a tall person. I'm five foot eight. I'm not six foot two like Woodward and Bernstein say. Ehrlichman, in talking to the president and Haldeman one day, said that little sob was here again with another subpoena, and that's on the White House tape. And the girls were trans the girls transcribed it and said, "Who do you think they're talking about?" <laughs> he said, "I'll tell you who they're talking about." <laughs> That that must make you feel very, very special. Yeah, I had my ups and downs. When did you first learn about the July 20th, 1972 tape, the one with the missing 18 and a half minutes of audio? Through the Watergate Special Prosecutor's Office, they began an inquiry with, uh, well, they were they began interviews, and then they, well, the grand jury was already sitting, so they were putting... Uh, uh, White House personnel through the grand jury, and then they asked us to uh, participate in interviews, and we took over the investigation and interviewed present and former uh, White House staffers at that time who had either were still at the White House or had left and were living in different parts of the country. So agents from uh, WFO were dispatched uh, throughout the country to uh, conduct the interviews. Uh, we didn't rely on on uh, any of the field offices because it was uh, we, we would have to set out all the explanation as to why we wanted this and why we wanted that. So the bureau approved that um, uh, we could dispatch agents from the field from WFO. So when when the stenographers, uh, you know, the young ladies that you were mentioning, were doing these tapes. You knew at that time that you no, had a no, tape. That, that, no, no, that tape that tape never came to us for transcription. That was actually discovered by the uh, the White House when they were reviewing the tapes before they went to Judge Sirica. They informed the judge that there was a problem with the tape. But no, we never got that tape. No, this was a tape that was made just three days after the break-in and just a day after that first article about the connection to the White House and the break-in appeared in the Washington Post. Right. So it's really a coincidence <laughs> that well, 18 and a half minutes is missing. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, it was never brought to a conclusion. Um, we had set up a program where we were going to conduct interviews and at the same time conduct polygraphs of of certain individuals. But uh, word had leaked out. In fact, it showed up in the press that... Um, we were going to polygraph, interview and polygraph Rosemary Woods, and that, that appeared in the newspaper. And as soon as that appeared, um, the people that we wanted to interview refused to be interviewed. So it was basically it just came to a screeching halt. Well, let's talk about the leaks, too, because, you know, of course, there's deep throat. You know, somebody is leaking information to Washington Post uh, reporters, you mentioned them yourself, Woodward and Bernstein. You were falsely accused of possibly being deep throat. I think um, some some uh, professor out at I, I can't remember the name of the university. I think it was the University of Chicago or something like that. They had uh, pursued a review of the entire case, and they came up with a couple of suspects, and I was named as one of them. Um, what did you think uh, about that? I thought it was lousy. It wasn't me. So when you found out that it was an FBI agent, the second in command, Mark Felt. He actually was one of several that was, was from, uh, we later determined from headquarters, that, that had been uh, speaking to um, people in the press. I mean, there were leaks to uh, 
Time magazine. There were leaks to the New York Times, uh, the Los Angeles Times. It wasn't only you – know, Mark Felt was responsible for a great deal of it, I'm sure. But uh, there were instances where there was other information passed, and and uh, we, we felt it was coming from somewhere else in, in the department. And when you say the department, the Justice Department or the FBI? The, the, the FBI. Wow. But it definitely wasn't any street agent because – we work with grand juries. We work criminal cases most of our life, and we, why would we go out and jeopardize our own case? Why would we tell the public, you know, what we're investigating? I mean, just like what's going on today, why would you tell anybody what you know what you're doing? Grand jury is supposed to be secret until until the end result comes out. So years later, when it was determined that it was Mark Felt, what did you think about that? Um, I, I wasn't too shocked. Uh, I, I always felt that it was somebody higher up in the, in, you know, into the bureau, um, somebody with access, just like we all had. And of course, he was just, you know, one person who was upset over the fact that some outsider was appointed or was going to be appointed director and not him. Mm. I'll tell you the funny, the probably, uh, well, there were two things that happened in, at the end. The, the, the big shots, as I call them, uh, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mardian, Mitchell, Colson, Parkinson, and Gordon Strawn all get indicted in the second round for obstruction and perjury and misprision of a felony and all that. And um, um, they get indicted. And, of course, all the charges are Title 18 investigated by the FBI. So what's, what's the rule? What's your administrative rule? You fingerprint them, photograph them, and you fill out that little green piece of paper, and you send it in to to, uh, to the bureau. So I'm thinking, holy mackerel, how am I going to do this? So I had a, a working relationship with with Judge Sirica. I had he had handled one of my other cases, which was a fairly big case a couple of years before the Berg before the break in, and uh, actually it was a year before, uh, and. Uh, I, I, so I had a, a, a good relationship with him. Um, so I called down to his office and I said, uh, Your Honor, I said, uh, uh, you know, the, these guys being indicted, I said, uh, part of my responsibility is fingerprint and photograph them. And he says, not in my courthouse. You're not going to cause any ruckus in my courthouse. And I said, but Your Honor, he says, look, you want a simple way out of this? He says, call their lawyers. And set it up with them. Okay, Your Honor. So I did. I called each of the lawyers. And what Sirica did on the second indictment, the second go-around, rather, um, he set the uh, uh, plea date. The indictment was returned like on a Wednesday. And rather than have a massive rush of press and everything else, he set the hearing for a Saturday. So I got a hold of the the individual lawyers and told them what my responsibilities were. And each of the defendants came to, to the Washington field office. Um, a couple of them came Friday afternoon to be fingerprinted and photographed. And then the rest of them came after they entered their plea on, uh, on Saturday morning, uh, to the field office. The amazing thing was that C1 squad, which sat next to the SAC's office, on the fifth floor of the old post office, showed up in mass on Saturday morning. They were all there because the mugging room. You ever been to WFO? No, I the never. No. Well, the the mug room for WFO was right outside, was in their squad room, and right outside the SAC's office. <laughs> so these guys are all making like they're working right there. <laughs> they're all in there Saturday watching the the entourage from the White House come in and, and be photographed and fingerprinted. Wow. I fingerprinted them, and uh, and Bob Lill, who's passed away, took their photographs. So can you say definitively, was there something on the tape that made it so clear and so apparent that these break-ins were not only condoned and, and known by Nixon, but that he actually ordered them? No. After the fact, yes. I know he was upset about Ellsberg. 
I don't think we ever heard any firsthand information from anyone that they informed the president that they had just committed a burglary or they had done such and such. If ev- if everything worked out positively, I'm sure they probably would have run in and said, "Hey, we just scored a, a you know a roundhouse home run here. We got this and this." No, I never heard anything like that. No one, to my knowledge, ever testified that he knew directly. Um, he knew after the fact uh, that these things occurred. He didn't know the day they happened. Uh, I'm I'm fairly certain of that. Okay, so what he was charged with was... He was an unindicted co-conspirator. They never indicted the president. And that was based on... The what the tapes showed that. The, the tapes just crucified him. I mean, he was in on every conversation about, you know, when, after it went down, after the burglary. I mean, there it is, two days, four days after the burglary, he's telling, he's telling uh, Haldeman to tell this, to the FBI to get out that this is a CIA matter, not the FBI. So four days after that, yes, he's guilty. Of obstruction. Of obstruction, yes. Okay. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. It's, you, can, you can hear that tape, I think. It, it's, on, it's on the computerized system somewhere. I, I will put a link you know, to that recording on the episode show notes. This must have been, I assume, uh, you know, a highlight of your career. Um, it was. I mean, I had, I think I was blessed with several good cases. So. Yeah, you had no other case that resulted in the President of the United States being, you know, no. kicked out no. of office. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody else has either. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Oh, wow. All right, so when did you retire? July of 89. And what have you been doing since then? I went where, I went back as an uh, uh, independent contractor with the Bureau, and then I, I uh, also did uh, security backgrounds for uh, the agency and um, Department of the Air Force. And then I did some PI work for about seven or eight years, and then I just hung it all up. <laughs> time to relax well i like to give everybody you know the last word a chance to either sum up your work on the watergate investigation or your career so what would you like to say it was interesting very fast you know it it was all encompassing i mean i was astounded when i heard the first watergate tape that we were asked to transcribe when i heard the abuse coming from the white house about individuals uh, the way people did not respect one another or respect others outside their authority, it, it always troubled me forever. I mean, it made me put everything else out of my mind. I, I, I could just never believe that the President of the United States would say or, or do things like this. It's just, you know, unfathomable. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, I have additional information about this case, including a screenshot of Angelo Lano from the Discovery Channel documentary, Watergate Scandal, A Third-Rate Burglary. There is also links to the FBI website, Famous Cases, and Vault containing original bureau records and files from the investigation of the break-in and cover-up. There's links to a Washington Post article and fast facts about Watergate from CNN. The most exciting is a link to the transcript and recording of the meeting between President Nixon and his chief of staff. That's at Smoking Gun Tape. If you enjoyed the episode, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. Social media share buttons are at the bottom of this episode show notes. If you're listening to this on a smartphone, you can also share this episode directly from your phone. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe so that you receive each episode of FBI Retired Case File Review directly to your phone each week. I have a great crime fiction recommendation for you this week. It is Give Us This Day by Tom Avitabile. Give Us This Day is an action-packed doomsday threat thriller with villains of a global level. 
The main character, Brooke Burrell, has retired from the FBI and taken what she believes is a safe and easy assignment with the Treasury Department. But the money laundering case she's investigating suddenly morphs into a terrorist financing national security case. I've had a chance to meet the author, and he is a witty, fast-talking, fun-loving New Yorker. And one of the best things about his book is that although it's about a very serious subject matter, Tom's personality is sprinkled throughout this book. Great job, Tom. So my crime fiction recommendation this week is Give Us This Day by Tom Avatabale. So check it out. And while you're on Amazon, don't forget to check out my crime novel, Pay to Play. As always, I will have this crime fiction recommendation in my next newsletter. Talking about the newsletter, don't forget to sign up at jerrywilliams.com. If you do, you'll have access to my FBI reading resource, which is a list of all of the great FBI books written by the FBI agents featured on this podcast. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.